we've been talking about Wesley's reflections on his Georgia ministry. Um, he's en route back to England, uh, and he is writing some things in his journal, uh, and I, that's where we left off. We talked about uh, four different items where Wesley's describing essentially the state of his soul, I think would be a good way uh, to express it, the state of his soul. And towards the end of the month, Wesley linked the issue of unbelief explicitly with the fear of death, a recurring theme during this period of time. And so this is what Wesley writes in his journal, quote, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? Who, what is he that will deliver me from this evil heart of unbelief? I have a fair summer religion. I can talk well, nay, and believe myself while no danger is near. But let death look me in the face, and my spirit is troubled. Nor can I say, to die is gain. And so, once again, Wesley is associating the fear of death with painful doubt, um, as well as the absence of peace due to the ongoing practice of sin. And this is what Wesley wrote, describing his Georgia experience. Quote, I fluctuated between obedience and disobedience. I had no heart, no vigor, no zeal in obeying, continually doubting whether I was right or wrong and never out of perplexities and entanglements. Wesley had hoped for spiritual power and for victory. Instead, he was plagued by doubt and by fear, and he often succumbed to the power of sin. This is not the kind of Christian life that John Wesley had envisioned for himself. Though Wesley was an Anglican priest, though he was assiduous in his pastoral duties, uh, and though he was in many respects a virtuous man while in Georgia, he yet comprehended in a very painful and honest way that he had not realized in his own life the extent of holiness which had so captured his imagination, as we said earlier, since 1725. Indeed, the difference here, the disparity uh, between the ideal of holiness on the one hand and then the actual practice on the other that repeatedly unsettled Wesley, made him uncomfortable. It was the cause of much anxiety and fear and was perhaps fed by three important elements during this period. First, the ghosts of Wesley's rigid and insensitive pastoral style were perhaps coming back to haunt him. I didn't go into great detail about this in the lecture, but Wesley had a difficult pastoral style. For example, a woman came forward and asked for her child to be baptized, and they could not agree upon the manner of the baptism, and so Wesley didn't perform the baptism. It's this sort of issue that came up. Uh, you also know about Wesley refusing communion uh, to, to Sophia Hopke. Uh, you know about that. And so you have to ask the question in terms of that kind of pastoral style, should not an Anglican priest be more kind, be more loving and tolerant in the administration of the means of grace? 
And how did Wesley's pastoral style uh, in Georgia, how did that speak of holy love as the goal of all? Uh, and how did it evidence the fragrance of the gospel of Jesus Christ? So that's a first consideration that we can raise here in this context. The second consideration, how can a man who had repeatedly expressed love and affection to his beloved, in this case, Sophia Hopke, and then turn around and humiliate both her and her family, not privately, which would have been bad enough, but publicly, but publicly. Was this holy love? Was this the grace of the gospel? And did hiding behind the Anglican ecclesiastical rules make uh, this humiliation any more just or any less offensive? Was Wesley's conscience unsettled because of his behavior here in terms of how he related to people? Was his conscience unsettled on this account? Did he begin to doubt both his motives and his actions uh, in this whole relationship? And perhaps such reflections, uh, such self-reflection uh, took away Wesley's peace uh, and took away his assurance. And again, uh, was this part of the problem that we pointed to earlier um, when Wesley had that anxiety attack, if you will, aboard the Samuel? Was some of this feeding into that? Uh, these are considerations to be looked at. And then thirdly, uh, as we have seen on board the Samuel, uh, Wesley now specifically connected the fear of death, that fear which has torment, uh, with disobedience and sinning. He connects it with disobedience and sinning. Um, and so this means that all the numerous references to the fear of death throughout the Georgian narrative uh, are uh, indicative of Wesley's own spiritual condition. Uh, we can make that judgment. It is indicative of his own spiritual condition. Uh, these references, and we can cite quite a bit of material here, demonstrate quite clearly that Wesley was during all this time, despite his good intentions and his virtue, that he was not someone who enjoyed the rich, sanctifying grace of God, that grace which makes one holy um, uh, and who receives the forgiveness of sin. Um, and so what makes this Georgian narrative then so fascinating is that Wesley was obviously sincere, he was obviously in earnest to live the Christian life in an exemplary way uh, and to realize holiness even to the extent of the intentions of his heart. That's what he wanted. Uh, and yet he was repeatedly frustrated, repeatedly frustrated in that endeavor. Frustrated again and again and again. That's what the Georgia narrative indicates. As noted earlier in the last lecture, Wesley had tried to manage his own spiritual life, that he would control it somehow, some way, as if the tempers and dispositions of his heart could be put right by reason, by rule, by resolution, by obeying commandments, this sort of thing. But in those attempts, and those are all attempts at self-justification. They're all attempts at self-justification, not the receiving of the justification of God that we have in Jesus Christ, okay? Uh, 
Uh, so in this, as Wesley tried to micromanage his own spiritual life, in that he failed again and again and again. He was like the person described by the Apostle Paul in Romans 7. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. And so what we see in the Georgia narrative, Wesley was of two minds, two minds, two wills while he was in Georgia. Uh, and he therefore lacked the simplicity, the purity of intention, which emerges from willing one thing, one thing preeminently. So in other words, another way of saying this, <coughs> is that Wesley, in light of Romans 7, was divided. He was a house divided. The uh, part of Wesley wanted to realize holiness in his life, and then the other part of Wesley chose the sin that was near at hand. And he was a house uh, divided here. And so his loves were, we say, disordered. They were disordered. They were not rightly all directed uh, in the knowledge and love of God. Uh, his loves, his will uh, was disordered, divided, and at times he was at odds with himself, with himself. Um, and so if uh, holiness and happiness are intricately related, and they clearly are, then John Wesley simply would have to find other means to realize that holiness that had captive, uh, captivated his, his heart. Uh, we can see this issue of conflict, we can look at it in another way. Um, again, using our example that we had earlier, um, uh, we were talking about, well, we could change the example, we could talk about someone who's addicted to drugs, for example, and let's say it's a husband and the wife of course, is, is suffering and wants her husband to be well. And the husband says to the wife, I want to stop. Is that a true statement? I believe it is. I believe one part of him does want to stop. It does. Uh, but the problem is another part of him doesn't want to stop. Uh, and so he's a house divided. Uh, that's the kind of conflict we see in Romans 7. Uh, you see the ideal, yes, I want to be free from this. I want to please my wife. I want to have good relationships with people. I want serenity, uh, but I cannot do it. I do the evil that is near at hand, okay? I desire it, I want it. I don't even think about it, I do it. It's done. Uh, this sort of thing. And so, as we said earlier, and I think this describes Wesley's experience in Georgia, um, <coughs> He is, like the one in Romans 7, a house divided. Therefore, John Wesley, all his attempts at self-justification are vain. They will fail. Why will they fail? Because John Wesley cannot make himself right before God. It's an impossibility. Can't do it. Impossible. No one could ever do it. No one could ever make themselves right with God by their own efforts, whether it's through rules, resolution, obeying commandments, whatever. It's impossible. John Wesley cannot solve the problem of John Wesley because John Wesley is the problem. <laughs> That's another way of saying it, as we were saying before. And so I don't doubt for a moment that Wesley was earnest, that he was sincere, that he wanted to live, but, you know, that he wanted to live in the grace and love of God, but he found out in Georgia that he could not do it. The Georgia experience had begun with high hopes. It ended with shattered dreams. It ended with shattered dreams and with very painful, very painful realities. Well, look at John Wesley now. This is actually a good place to be. Uh, 
because he is broken. He has failed again and again. And the thing I like about John Wesley in his biography, in his journal, in his letters, is that he is honest with himself. I love that. I love that. He doesn't try to, you know, uh, whitewash it and, and not see the failures that he's engaged in. And that is good. So Wesley is chastened by his Georgia experience. He's unsettled by bouts of anxiety and fear. And so as this ship, the Samuel, is pulling into Deal Harbor, England, okay, uh, Wesley records a number of things in his journal. This is February 1st, February 1st, 1738. And Wesley is going to make four key observations in his journal on this day, which describe his spiritual estate, his spiritual condition at the time. And this is what he writes in terms of the first, quote, it is now two years and almost four months since I left my native country in order to teach the Georgian Indians the nature of Christianity. But what have I learned myself in the meantime? <clears throat> Why, what I least of all suspected, that I who went to America to convert others was never myself converted to God. Now, I should immediately add, lest there be misunderstanding, that much later on in his life, as a matter of fact, in 1774, Wesley goes back to this journal comment and he writes a little note. He writes a little note, which of course represents the perspective of a 71-year-old man at that time, but at any rate, he writes a little note and in terms of this first observation, this is the note that he writes. He writes, uh, I who went to America to convert others was never myself to con converted to God. And then he writes, I am not sure of this. He writes, I am not sure of this. So uh, this issue, was Wesley converted in Georgia or no, uh, it's an open question. He, he's not sure. He's, I'm not sure of this. But again, this is the perspective of a man who's 71 years old, looking back uh, upon a, a, a young man, a young man and his experience. Okay. Um, so Wesley writes, makes a second comment in his journal. And this is what he writes. His second very humble and, and self-reflected observation on February 1st touched upon his well-worked theme of what it means to be a real Christian. Okay, And this is what Wesley writes. Um, that I, as touching outward moral righteousness, am I blameless? Uh, having a rational conviction of all the truths of Christianity, does all this give me a claim to the holy, heavenly, divine character of a Christian? By no means. If the oracles of God are true, if we are still to abide by the law and the testimony, all these things, uh, though when ennobled by faith in Christ, uh, they are holy, just, and good, yet without it are dung and dross, okay? Uh, however, Wesley adds to this note, uh, adds to this uh, observation in his journal, he adds a little note later on in 1774, and this is what he writes. I had even then the faith of a servant, the faith of a servant, though not of a son, okay? So he's talking about his Georgia experience, He's, he's reflecting back upon it, 1774, he's writing this note, he's appending it to this journal entry I just read, and he's saying, I had even then the faith of a servant, but not of a son, but not that of a son. Uh, and so what we see here is that later on, certainly not certainly not while Wesley's in Georgia, he's talking about degrees of faith, degrees of faith, okay? Uh, 
Uh, and you should know, you should know that Wesley describes the faith of a servant in his writings uh, in a couple of different ways, but I'm just going to mention one to make the point because lots of people in Wesley's studies say, oh, faith of a servant, faith of a son, does it make a difference? Does it make a difference? Uh, no, it does make a difference, a big difference. The faith of a servant is a measure of faith, and so we want to acknowledge that uh, and encourage it. It is a faith, but Wesley associates the faith of a servant with the spirit of bondage, because in his sermon, the spirit of bondage and of adoption, uh, he specifically links the faith of a servant with the spirit of bondage. In other words, those who are still under the power and dominion of sin, who are waiting for their justification. He is nigh that justifieth, you know, Wesley writes. Uh, and so those who would like to claim that the faith of a servant is justifying faith, is the faith of a real Christian in every instance, that can't be the case because Wesley specifically lists the faith of a servant with the spirit of bondage. And in that sermon, he's comparing the spirit of bondage with the spirit of adoption. And those are two different things, okay? So what's happening here, this is important, what's happening here in 1774? Wesley is recognizing that while he was in Georgia, he had faith. Uh, he had faith. He had the faith of a servant. The question you have to ask now is, was that saving faith that Wesley had? And I would answer that question, no, it was not saving faith because it's faith of a servant uh, in the sense of the spirit of bondage, okay? Um, again, what's another way of looking at that? Wesley, in his sermon... Uh, taught in one of his important sermons talks about the natural state, the legal state, the evangelical state. And we're going to be talking about that in the theological part of the course. The legal state, okay, is someone who is not quite entered in. Wesley refers to it at times as the faith of a Jew. Uh, you know, knowing the law, but not able to live into the law. Uh, that their conscience is still bothered, uh, that they are serving in a legal way and not in the way of a son or a daughter, or a child of God. So the difference between um, the legal state and the evangelical state is another way to get at this issue. And it's an important issue because it's going to be at the heart of Wesley's practical theology. So those who are awakened who fear God. See, that would be the characteristic of the legal state. They don't love God. They fear God. They fear God. Um, uh, whereas those who are in the evangelical state, they love God. Okay, they love God. There's that transition from fear to love of God. Uh, but Wesley wants to affirm the measure of faith that it is. In other words, if someone says... Um, you know, I, I'm, I want to repent of my sins, I want to receive faith in Jesus Christ, uh, but I have not yet entered in. That person should not be discouraged, but encouraged to acknowledge the grace in their life. And there is grace in their life. We call this prevenient grace. We call this convincing grace. The Holy Spirit is convincing, convicting that person of their need for Christ, okay? And they will, if they do not depart by the way, they will enter in. They will receive the faith of a child of God, which, you know, loves God and, and, and not in a legal way fears God, okay? So this is actually very important here, and we'll talk about this again in the theological part of the course. Now, the third observation that Wesley made in his journal at this time was the most despairing, <laughs> the most despairing and therefore the most inaccurate of all. Wesley described his uh, position, his spiritual condition while in Georgia. He writes, I am a child of wrath and heir of hell. 
And then, not surprisingly, later on in 1774, he writes, I believe not. I believe not. And so Wesley is saying that while he was in Georgia, uh, he was not a child of wrath, not an heir of hell. In a sense, he was on the way of redemption. Uh, he was under convincing grace uh, and therefore should be encouraged, okay? Uh, but we could not call this saving grace because saving grace such as the new birth has particular marks and we don't see those here. And then the fourth comment that Wesley makes in his journal, the little paragraph he writes, while the ship is pulling into Deal Harbor on February 1st, uh, he indicated that the faith he wanted, so he's, he's saying, what kind of faith do I want? And the kind of faith he wants is a sure trust and confidence in God that through the merits of Christ, my sins are forgiven and I reconcile to the favor of God. Um, and then what did Wesley write in terms of the note that he appended in 1774? He, he wrote, uh, I wanted the faith of a son. That's what he writes, I wanted the faith of a son. Meaning he didn't have it yet, but that's what he wanted. He wanted the faith of a son. He wanted the faith of a child of God. Uh, and so there is this difference. Wesley in later life is gonna realize there are degrees of faith. There are degrees of faith, uh, faith along the way of the path of salvation. Uh, there are those who are under the conviction of their sins. They have a measure of grace and faith. They are to be encouraged. Uh, until they enter into the liberty, and it is a liberty, the liberty of the children of God uh, to love God uh, and to be free uh, from the guilt uh, and power of sin. And so, though Wesley, uh, while he was in Georgia, was not uh, a child of wrath, neither, however, was he a child of God. Um, and in fact, it was precisely the later Wesley uh, who was matured and steeped in age, he was old, uh, who noted in retrospect at the beginning of 1738 that he desired nothing less than the faith of a son, a faith of a child, the faith of a child of God. Okay, so these, this journal commentary is very important. It's a good window uh, on Wesley's life. Now, uh, a couple of days later, after the passengers of the Samuel had disembarked, um, Wesley is noting that God had, to use his own words, in some measure humbled me and proved me, he writes, and shown me what was in my heart. And, and so we see then that the Georgia venture the Georgia missionary journey uh, had not been all negative, uh, uh, that it had great value in terms of Wesley's own journey because it prepared him uh, to be open in a very humble and teachable way to all that God had in store for him and there was much in store. There was much in store. Now, you know already uh, that John Wesley uh, was learning much from the Moravians. Uh, so when he's back in England after his Georgia ministry, he immediately seeks out Moravians and to have conversation. And so on February 7th, 1738, Wesley had the good fortune to meet Peter Burla. Uh, who was a Moravian missionary, uh, and he met him at the house of a Mr. Wynatz, who was a Dutch merchant. And Wesley wrote in his journal on that day, you remember what he wrote earlier on when he had seen the Moravian serenity in the face of powerful storms. Here he writes when he encounters this Moravian, Peter Burla, a day much to be remembered. Okay, 
uh, and they have a conversation. They have a conversation. It goes back and forth. And Peter Berla is John Wesley's junior by about a decade. He's like 10 years younger than John Wesley, and he's giving him counsel. Uh, and he says to Wesley, again, in a kind of direct way, your philosophy uh, must be purged away. He said, that philosophy of yours, whatever that meant, uh, in terms of what Wesley told Peter Berla, that must be purged away. And so Wesley was intrigued by this dialogue, uh, and especially by Berla's understanding of the nature of saving faith. What is saving faith? See, not every faith is saving. Saving faith has characteristics, has marks, has traits. Not all faith is saving faith. Um, and Peter Berla is going to help John Wesley in terms of the nature of saving faith. And what is, he, what is he going to say to John Wesley? What is he going to say to John Wesley? Um, he's going to fill this out uh, in a theological way that saving faith um, can be expressed we can express it in two H words if we're using English, uh, happiness and holiness, or two P words, again, if we're using English, peace and power. Uh, I'll come back to this and view it a, di a different way theologically. Happiness in the sense of the happiness that results from the sense of forgiveness, uh, holiness in the sense of the transformation of being, that happens in the new birth. So happiness and holiness is another way of talking about justification uh, and talking about, and, and then holiness, talking about regeneration or the new birth. So happiness and holiness, freedom from the guilt of sin on the one hand, freedom from the power of sin on the other. And so this is what Berla is teaching Wesley that saving faith results in happiness. It's marked by happiness and also holiness, holiness. And we can understand this theologically in terms of this is what is meant by justification, uh, the reception of the forgiveness of sins, uh, the reception of the forgiveness of sins, the freedom from the guilt of sins, uh, and then holiness in terms of regeneration. We can express it theologically in terms of regeneration or the new birth. Another way of saying this is freedom from the power or dominion of sin. Happiness and holiness, uh, peace, we can use our P words up here. Peace on this side, peace, and over here, power, power, okay? And so Peter Berla is teaching John Wesley that saving faith, saving faith is ever marked by happiness and holiness or by peace and power. Peace from the sense of forgiveness that Christ died for our sins at Aldersgate, for example, Wesley will state in his Aldersgate narrative that Christ died for me, even me. See, that's the language of justification, the reception of the forgiveness of sins. Christ died for me, even me, and saved me from the law of sin and death. That last part, that's, that's the power part. That's regeneration. And saved me from the law of sin and death. There are your two pieces of saving faith that Peter Berla con, uh, communicated to John Wesley. So no doubt, no surprise, that he wrote in his journal on that day, a day much to be remembered. Okay? Let's take questions just for, for uh, 10 minutes. We'll take, we have 10 minutes for questions. Let's take some questions. Okay. Yes. Um, 
<laughs> I'm not getting anything. Oh, uh, you have to speak up. The translator cannot hear you. Did John Wesley have a family? Uh, he had a wife. Uh, he eventually got married. Um, uh, Mary Vazai. Um, uh, but he did not have any children. He did not have any children. And his marital life um, was not a happy one. I, I think that's fair to say. It's a complicated relationship. Um, it was not a happy marriage. Um, and indeed, at, at points, they separated. Uh, John Wesley separated from his wife. Um, and uh, in as things progressed, uh, they ended up finally separated such that when Mary Vazai died, John Wesley didn't even know about it until later. Uh, so it was a, a difficult, a troubling relation, relationship. It's complicated. I don't think it's easily discussed. Um, but let me say this. Let me say this point, because here's what I encounter uh, when students read about John Wesley's relationship with his life, and they do something that I don't think is wise to do. This is what they do. They, they look at his relationship with his wife, and they say, hmm, you know, I, I don't think that's very good. Therefore, I'm not going to take what John Wesley says seriously because his relationship with his wife was not good, okay? And it broke up into separation. And I, th I don't think that's a wise thing to do. I don't think that's a wise thing to do uh, because I think what Wesley is offering the church is very valuable in terms of the inculcation of real, true, proper scriptural Christianity. Um, and I am not quick to sit in the judgment seat in terms of other people's affairs, their relationships. And as I said, it's a very complicated relationship. And there are faults on both sides. Um, my own judgment is that John Wesley should have never gotten married because he was already married. He was married to his ministry. And I, and I think Mary uh, Vazai had a problem with that. You know, John Wesley said to his wife a few days after they got married, he said something to the effect, I'm, I'm quoting, but I'm pretty close, maybe a little paraphrase, but pretty close. I will not preach one sermon less nor travel one mile less in a married state as in a single state. This is what he told his wife. Perhaps he should have told her that before they got married. <laughs> and so Wesley was gone, constantly gone. Originally, Mary accompanied Wesley on the rounds of ministry, but it was too much for her. It was too much for her, and so she stopped traveling with John Wesley, which meant that Wesley was often gone, okay? Um, and that becomes a problem. That becomes a real problem. And I, I really think, I don't know why John Wesley got married. It just, it didn't make much sense. He was like the Apostle Paul, you know, the Apostle Paul constantly moving. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, good question, good question. Yep, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, Susanna, Susanna, Matthew Wesley. Uh, в этом периоде она продолжает э, иметь общение с сыном. Uh, I'm trying to remember the death of Susanna Wesley when that happened. Um, I believe it happened. I have to check this actually. That's interesting. Um, I, I, I'll check it for you, and I'll, I'll come back. I don't want to say, I want to give you an exact answer, so I will check it. But during this time, she is alive. Oh, yeah, she's alive. She dies, I believe, in the 1740s, but I, I, I don't want to, I want to check that, uh, the exact date of her death. Uh, she's alive during this time, 
Um, and she sees the rise of the revival and everything, you know, with field preaching and John and Charles Wesley. She, she knows all about this. Um, she has um, a very important spiritual experience when she receives uh, communion um, from her son-in-law, who gives Wesley Hall, who gives her communion, and uh, she had this rich sense that Christ died for her, uh, and that she too was a child of God. She had that experience as well. Uh, but yes, she is alive during this period, all of this period. Um, yes, and I'll, I'll I'll look up the exact date for you. I'm sorry about that. In terms of Susanna, yeah, yeah, yep. Other. Questions, um, comments? Yes. Is Susanna alive when the John is getting married? John, yeah, John gets gets married later. It's act, it's actually later. Uh, I was thinking maybe Susanna had some kind of opinion about the, when Johnny getting married. Uh, is it the right or not or something? That that John Wesley had yeah. some view about whether it was Susanna. That Susanna had oh oh or something. Yeah, uh, Susanna is not really involved uh, in terms of John Wesley and marrying. The one who is involved is his brother Charles his brother Charles, because you know about the Sophia Hopke relationship in Georgia, but then later on, Wesley uh, meets a woman, her name is Grace Murray, and Wesley believes that she you know, could possibly become his wife, and she was um, interested also in another man, and Charles Wesley made sure that Grace Murray married this other man, uh, and John Wesley was deeply crushed. He was deeply crushed by that. Uh, so Charles Wesley had interfered, uh, made sure that Grace Murray married someone else, uh, and Wesley was deeply pained. He talks about it as one of the most painful days of his life. You know, when he received word about this. So Wesley's relationships with women uh, were not very good uh, and painful for him uh, and occasions of, um, yeah, occasions of suffering um, even. So, I, I mean, my own sense is that having failed in terms of Sophia Hopke, having failed in terms of Grace Murray, that when he meets Mary Vazai, he was supposed to inform his brother Charles, as was custom among the Methodists, of his intentions, and John lets that go, and he marries Mary Vazai, and Charles Wesley was quite upset. Uh, he was quite upset with that. Um, so you can see how complicated this gets and how difficult it gets, um, but uh, John Wesley was so, devoted to his ministry. I mean, the labor, the rounds, the extent of it, that could he really give a wife the attention uh, and care uh, that a wife needs? See, that, that's, that's a question to be raised, so. Okay, well, thank you.